Jesus teaches and tells the parable that we're reading today in response to a question from one of his disciples. And the question or the request the disciple has is this. They say, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Now, it seems like a really basic question. Um, it seems almost rudimentary because if we remember, their culture would have been extremely religious. Their culture and their religion almost go hand in hand. So they would have been people surrounded by prayer. They would have heard people praying in many occasions. They probably would have prayed a lot themselves. So it seems kind of odd that the disciple has this request, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. But maybe there seems to be something more to the prayers of John the Baptist and Jesus. Of Jesus, we know it was commonly spoken that he spoke as one with real authority, not like the religious leaders. And so I'm assuming that John the Baptist and Jesus prayed as people with real authority, not just uh, like a mastery of what they were doing, but more about the connection that they had with God, that they had authority because they had this genuine connection with God that showed up when they prayed and was evident to those around them. So Jesus hears this request, Lord, teach us to pray, and then he provides a blueprint. He teaches them how to pray. He says, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Jesus gives them a solid how-to. He gives them the priorities that ought to be mentioned in prayer, the things that seem to really have the heart and the attention of God that we ought to pray about. And so he goes on and teaches them how to pray. But even beyond that, he teaches them about who they are praying to. And he does this by telling a story or by telling a parable. He says, suppose you have a friend. And you go to him at midnight and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me, and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. Uh, I'm going to stop us right there. I'm going to stop at the statement, Don't bother me. Um, because it doesn't matter for us if this request comes at midnight or not kind of a mantra for our current age and the generations in which we live is almost don't bother me. We don't want to be bothered by other people. It's almost a phrase for our present day. And we don't identify as much for the request for bread. I mean, go ahead. I dare you. I dare you to go to your neighbor's house, knock on the door and ask for three loaves of bread. Do it any time of day. You'll just be looked at like you're a weirdo. Uh, we don't relate to that request much at all. But we do relate to that sensation of being bothered, of being annoyed. And I think it's a fairly recent sensation for some reason. As a kid, I remember people would come to the door and ring the doorbell and I would go running to the door to see who it was. Maybe it was someone selling something. Maybe it was a friend. Maybe it was an enemy. Maybe it was a religious person. It could have been any number of people, but it was always interesting to see who it was that was coming to your door. And no matter who they were, it was almost a welcome thing. And now for some reason, answering the door feels like a big hassle. It feels like a big annoyance when I hear the door knock or when I hear the doorbell ring. Uh, I almost think, who could be so rude as to knock on my door when I'm at home? Can't they see the door is closed? Can't they say I'm like a turtle? I'm safely within my shell. You don't see the turtle. That means leave the turtle alone. That seems to be how it is with our houses and our apartments these days. It feels like they're more like fortresses than places that we would ever want to welcome people to. So why is that? Well, we, we kind of have these smartphones now, and I think that somewhat contributes to it. Um, we have this ability to connect with anyone around the world on our smartphones, and we have the ability to do so when we want to make that connection. But heaven forbid that the phone rings, and that we have to answer it or a tech texts come in repeatedly. We just have this 
overarch of fe overarching feeling of constantly being bothered whenever anyone wants our attention, whether it involves coming to the door, whether it involves giving us a phone call or sending us a text, no matter what it is, it seems like we're on edge and we're just bothered over everything, every single contact that people have with us. So the more curmudgeonly of us would say, well, we should just get rid of those cell phones. But I don't think that would solve much because I think we would find some other barrier between us and other people that we could use as a wedge between us. I think more of what we have to do is to say, Lord Jesus, please heal us of our bothered hearts. Well, let's look back at the story again. The, the friend at home doesn't just not want to be bothered. They're being bothered at midnight. They're coming at a very inconvenient time. And so the friend says these things when the person knocks on their door. They say, don't bother me. The door is already locked. My children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I mean, these seem like legit excuses. It's midnight. It's late. It's stupid late. It's a very inconvenient time to come and ask for these things. It's an annoying request at an inconvenient time. But simply because the request is asked, we learn that the request is answered. The friend does not turn this request down. The friends, uh, Jesus goes on to say, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. The interaction is honored because of the friend's shameless audacity. It's an annoying request at an inconvenient time, but the request is honored. Now, have you ever asked for anything inconvenient or odd or awkward? Have you ever asked for something really dumb and the request was acknowledged? Well, I have. I have several times and to surprising results. Uh, a few years ago, I preached a sermon called Get in the Ring. And it was about the instance where Jacob was wrestling with God. And so I talked to Pure Power Wrestling, which is our local wrestling association, and asked them if I could borrow their ringside bell. I have no personal connection with Pure Power Wrestling. I am a stranger to them, but I called them up and I asked them if they, I could borrow their ringside bell for a sermon illustration. And they said yes. I almost couldn't believe it. Um, but it seems like they were willing to honor my shameless audacity, even though they didn't know me, had no connection with me before, and it was a ridiculous request. When I was at Prairie Bible College, a couple of friends on my floor loved eating Shreddy's cereal. They would eat it all hours of the day. And they would go to the kitchen in the cafeteria and ask for Shreddy's at lunch, at supper, and they would be brought shreddies. Now keep in mind this is a Bible college cafeteria. It's not like ordering at a restaurant. It's not like you're ordering off menu. You're asking for something that's not even on the menu or being considered at the time. But the people in the kitchen would go and get them their shreddies and let them eat shreddies any time of day. They used shameless audacity to ask for something that was almost out of bounds. Now further to that, Brad and Graham also wanted to share their appreciation with Nabisco, who makes shreddies. So they wrote this glowing thank you letter to Nabisco, thanking them for shreddies and saying how much they enjoyed their product. And Nabisco responded. It sent them a letter back. It sent them a few recipes of what you can do with shreddies, but it was an appreciation for their appreciation. Uh, and Nabisco didn't have to do that, but with shameless audacity, Graham and Brad wrote this letter, and they were responded to. In both of these situations, the person with shameless audacity had nothing to lose. If I contact Pure Power Wrestling and ask for their ringside bell and they say no, well, that's almost an expected response. Um, there's nothing I'm going to lose between myself and them if they say no. There's nothing at risk here. Uh, if the Prairie Cafeteria said no to Brad and Graham getting shreddies at supper, there's no risk to them. At worst, 
they're going to be met with an eye roll and maybe that's it. But they ask with shameless audacity and their request is honored. If pure power wrestling is going to hear me as a stranger and honor my request that I give with shameless audacity, how much more is God going to acknowledge any request that I have of him? Present your request to God with shameless audacity. You have nothing to lose. If the Bible College Cafeteria is going to acknowledge the shameless audacity request of Brad and Graham for Shreddies, how much more is God going to hear us out when we come to him with requests of shameless audacity? You have nothing to lose. God hears and engages with our requests of shameless audacity because of God's character. Jesus goes on to explain God's character as good and generous. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God listens, God engages with us, even when we ask for preposterous things. God lovingly hears our requests of shameless audacity. Now, you may hear me say that God has a character that is good and generous, and you may say, well, duh, I have heard this before, I know this information. But, I would say to you that in a lot of situations, I don't think we truly understand how good and how gracious God is in his interactions with us. If we really believed in a good and generous God, why are our reactions towards one another and towards other people so stingy? Why do we treat people when they just want our attention like they are completely bothering us? If I have a real and genuine connection with a good and a generous God, that ought to show up in my actions and my attitudes towards other people. It ought to translate into me living a good and generous life towards and with others. If we really believed in this good and generous God, why would we see ourselves as obnoxious to God? Why do we withhold requests from God because we feel like we're either bothering God or he'd really be annoyed by these requests. If we really believed in this good and generous God, why do we assume that other people are completely obnoxious to God just because they are obnoxious to us? Jesus says, if then, though you are evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus says, if then, though you are evil. And we may think, well, Jesus, isn't that taking it a bit far, saying uh, we're evil? I don't know. Is he taking it a bit far? When I look at my own attitude towards other people, there's not a lot of grace there. My inner thoughts and some of what spills out into action can certainly be spoken of as evil. Now, here's a really bad example. I get really bothered when I hear of churches that flaunt COVID-19 regulations and rules, when they really make a big deal of it and a big stink of it, when they get in other people's faces about it, it really drives me crazy because I feel like it reflects on other churches poorly. I feel it reflects on Christians poorly. I feel it reflects on Christ poorly when this happened. And so I get really grouchy about people that have these attitudes and have these practices in this time of the pandemic. And I think unhappy thoughts about those people. I wish them unwell. I find my attitude going quickly to, well, fine, if you're not going to follow the rules, well, I hope you get sick. In my judgment, I feel like I'm being fair. I feel like I'm saying, well, here's the consequence if you don't follow these rules, so it's a logical consequence. But it really isn't fair. I find the scales in my own life Instead of tipping towards a balance of fairness, they're tipping more towards evil, wishing poorly for someone else, maybe even wishing for their illness. And that is not a good space to be in. That could easily be categorized as evil. And that's in my own mind and in my own heart. I know parts of my heart. I know 
how easily I trend towards evil and stinginess. I know how petty I can be. And apparently, God is not like that. God is certainly just, but God is love. God is good, and God is generous. And we know from our own dealings with God, he does not deal with us as our sins deserve. He extends far more grace and goodness to us than we deserve. We very undeservedly get to call God our parent. We haven't earned that. We haven't done anything to earn that title. But we get to call God our parent. We get to call God Father. And we get to go to that parent and make bold requests. We get to ask with shameless audacity. So don't be afraid to ask. If something comes to mind that's a problem, do not be afraid to bring that request to God. Don't fear that you have to speak to God in just a very specific way in order for him to hear you. It is in God's character of goodness and of graciousness to hear you out. So come at midnight. Pound on the door. Ask. Seek. Knock. You are not inconveniencing God the Father. You are not bothering Jesus. In the final verse uh, of this passage, Jesus says, If you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When we ask, seek, knock, we are often thinking of the stuff, of the specific problems that we're asking God to solve, but so much of it isn't that at all. When we ask, when we seek, when we knock, we are asking for a connection with God. And God does not withhold himself from us. In this passage, Jesus says, your Father in heaven will give the Holy Spirit to those who ask of him. The Holy Spirit empowers us in whatever situation we are in. The Holy Spirit is God's presence with us in whatever situation we are in. And God does not withhold himself in the ways that we think that he does. God longs to be present with us. He longs to do life together with us. And so we ought to go to him constantly with our requests, with our concerns, with shameless audacity, with shameless audacity, asking him to help us out. He does not withhold his son Jesus from us. He offers his Holy Spirit to us, which empowers us and is present with us. God is good and God is generous. He is a true friend at midnight. We can boldly go to God and ask God for his help at any time with shameless audacity. Let's pray. God, we ask today that you would just look at our hearts and just examine for any wicked way within us. And we thank you that you do forgive those things. Help us to bring those things to you, to repent of those things, and to learn, turn our lives back to you once more. We thank you that we can come to you with shameless audacity. When things are bothering us, when we don't know which way is up, when we have very specific problems in our lives and very specific requests, we ask that we would boldly come to you with those things, that we would trust in your goodness and we would trust in the graciousness that you give to us, and that above all else, we would trust that you are there, that you are present, and that you care for us. We ask, God, that we would understand you as good and gracious, and that as we understand that you are good and gracious, that we would live in a way that extends that goodness and that grace to other people in our lives around us. Help us to live in a good and generous way that follows after Jesus. In your name, amen.